Hello everyone and welcome. Welcome to today's session. Um, I thought it's the weekend coming up. I can't be with you live today, but I've made this a premiere video. So please feel free to chat and engage and connect with everyone who's watching. Uh, today we're going to talk about sleep, something that hopefully on the weekend we can be more um, uh, forgiving around and more allowing of for ourselves. And I think it's a great way to start the weekend is thinking about how we can use sleep as a, as a really big part of our restorative process in recovery and mental health. Sleep is so indicated in every single part of the human physiology, you know, from the basic metabolic processes all the way through to mental health and living and connecting with others. So I want to start today um, with an affirmation in some ways, like I always do. So today, please hold that you are restoration. I may be worn down, but I may also be restored. I may be worn down, but I may also be restored. And that's a lovely way to hold oneself um, always, to know that I am dynamic. I am forces that move sometimes backwards and forwards. Um, my path is never a straight line. Uh, there may be times where I feel like I move a bit backwards, but I know that I can also then move forwards into a process of restoration. So today is all about sleep. Let's jump in. I'm using a lot of the content today around uh, Matthew Walker's book, Why We Sleep. It is incredible. He starts the book off with this fantastic uh, paragraph that says, Amazing breakthrough. Scientists have discovered a revolutionary new treatment that makes you live longer. It enhances your memory and makes you more creative. It makes you look more attractive. It keeps you slim, lowers food cravings. It protects you from cancer and dementia. It wards off colds and flu. It lowers your risk of heart attacks and stroke, not to mention diabetes. You'll even feel happier, less depressed, and less anxious. Are you interested? <laughs> and I suppose he's doing the bait and switch here, but what he's talking about is sleep, because sleep is implicated in everything. And I've heard a lot of mental health professionals and doctors, uh, particularly neuroscientists, speaking about, the researchers speaking about how if we could get decent sleep, unencumbered sleep, you know, without having to use uh, extraneous methods to get the sleep, we would actually solve a lot of our mental health issues because we would be in the best possible si position every day to face the challenges and stresses that we have instead of being on the back foot. And he's talking here, of course, around sleep. This book is incredible. I listened to the audio book. It was fantastic. Matthew Walker has done many things, but basically he's become uh, an incredible s uh, sleep researcher um, from the fields of psychology and neuroscience to actually doing tests. A vast amount of testing was done for this book to get the data that sits inside. So I highly recommend it. And today I'm going to go through some of the areas and some tips for getting better sleep as well. So what I want to start off with is a lot of people will talk about getting a certain amount of hours per, s per night. Um, but it's actually more important that we fulfill the cycles of sleep that we have. And you can see here in the period there are different cycles of sleep and they kind of repeat. So the REM um, or the rapid eye movement cycle is where they know that the brain is doing a huge amount of housekeeping. Uh, and this is the part where we usually have super interesting dreams uh, and sometimes disturbing dreams, but this is when a lot of our dream life kind of happens. But there's also a really important other part, which is NREM. And this is when the body um, is has slow wave sleep, when it's doing a lot of the, the work of pruning away all the difficult memories um, and also reorganizing things from the day before. And both of these are super important. And as you can see, if you kind of keep waking up at certain periods, you know, in the beginning there's more NREM and towards the end of your sleep pattern there's more REM. And so you can't say, well, I got four good hours because then you only got good NREM sleep and you got fairly poor REM sleep. Um, and if you said, well, I, f I fell asleep at four eventually and I slept for a f three really, I, f I felt really good, I slept for three or four really good hours, then you also in some ways are not going through a full cycle and we need REM to prune away some of the traumatic memories, the, the incident from the emotion, and I'm gonna get into that shortly. But this is basically the sleep cycle and why the eight hours are thought of as the best duration, because it fulfills all these processes that have to happen, this yin and the yang of the REM and the NREM sleep um, as we do. Um, so what he's saying is that NREM dominates the early part of your sleep cycle. And then it's followed by this rapid eye movement sleep dominance later in the morning, uh, which most of us, you know, are, are we are unaware that those are the two processes. And since your brain desires most of its REM sleep in the last part of the night, 
um, which is to say the late morning hours, and this is part of the circadian rhythm, right? This is not because you can push it out. You will lose 60 to 90% of your REM sleep, uh, even though you're losing only 25% of your actual sleeping time if you are sleeping only for five to six hours. So having a full duration of sleep at the right time, and in the book he goes into great detail about why we should sleep in accordance with our circadian rhythm, because body processes are primed in those times and they can't be optimized if we sleep outside of those times. So they did a lot of tests on, well, what happens if you don't get sleep? And a lot of us will know what happens. We feel grumpy, we feel annoyed, we feel short, we feel foggy. But they did a lot of really good testing. Um, and they, they tested a whole lot of sports professionals um, and they saw the incidence um, for sports injury. And the people who had only three hours less sleep were vastly more affected by injury than those who got a full eight or nine hours. The people getting eight or nine hours hardly had any, up to 20% chance of getting injuries. Those who got six hours or less were 70% more likely to have sports injuries um, in, their, in their daily kind of uh, profession. Um, and then they looked at you know, the increases in car crashes and these risks for car crashes. And you can see a devastating number on top here. People that were getting seven hours and above of sleep only had a 1.3 chance of car crash risk. And those who had less than four hours, uh, it kind of goes without saying, had an 11 uh, times greater and more chance of something really bad happening with a motor vehicle collision. So we know that we have all of these effects on cognition, and I think that's, that's fairly well understood. But what is also interesting to see is as we've started sleeping less as a society, we started becoming more overweight and having metabolic syndromes and struggling with, with kind of weight loss. Um, and you can see over the years from the 40s onwards, you know, um, how obesity in general has, has, has skyrocketed, but also sleeping, the amount of sleep quality and sleep time has drastically reduced. Um, and for, <laughs> for any statisticians, they like these kind of curves. Of course, it is a correlation. It's not causal, it's not the only reason, but it is a very important metric one must look at. And in terms of mental health and recovery and addiction, the most important thing is trauma work. And when we think about trauma work, we obviously go through the process of, of doing the trauma work, but the real magic happens when one sleeps. And he says here, however, the capacity to forget can, in certain contexts, be as important as the need for remembering, both in day-to-day -day life, for example, forgetting last week's parking spot in preference for today's, you need to remove the one to remember the next, um, and clinically, in, exercise, in exercising painful, disabling emotional memories or extinguishing emotions tied to traumatic content. And this is very powerful because he says, in this way, sleep helps you retain everything you need and nothing that you don't, improving the ease of memory recollection. Said another way, forgetting is the price you pay for remembering. Now, what's important to know is that once we can process traumatic memories properly, there is still an emotional content tied to the actual content, the thing that happened and the emotions that kind of cover it. And what the sleep cycle does is it gently pairs away the emotional content, leaving just the actual objective content so that it, it doesn't kind of wrap up together anymore. So when I think about the event, I don't get the emotional kind of um, collusion which happens and floods me. Uh, and this is why sleep is so important. And that's why getting over heartbreak or pain or grief, people say, it just takes time. What it really takes is good sleep. And this is one of the most important factors when I read the book or when I was listening to the book. And he says that is the REM sleep, and remember this is the four good hours towards the end of your cycle in the right circadian rhythm, takes the painful sting out of difficult, even traumatic emotional episodes you've experienced during the day, offering emotional resolution when you wake the next morning. And they've seen this, and this is a, a fa fascinating, in the middle part of the book, he talks about actual studies where they could show this the process happening through scans on the brain. And that's fundamental when one considers recovery uh, and treating addiction and treating traumatic um, memories. Um, one needs to get good sleep. So I have a few um, tips here for you, because it's a weekend, and to allow yourself the space to try and find some good sleep, is the first thing is, Stick to a sleep schedule. Now, I know that everyone says that, but generally our sleep schedule is turning the alarm on for waking up. He says, make an alarm that you honor to go to bed. <laughs> that way you don't really have to worry about the alarm to wake up. Your body will probably wake up when it's ready uh, after uh, seven to eight hours. So he says here, set an alarm for bedtime. Often we set an alarm for when it's time to wake up, but fail to do so for when it's time to go to sleep. 
and he says if it's only one piece of advice to take away from, it's actually only 11 tips a day, uh, it should be that you stick to a sleep schedule and set an alarm when you go to bed. Exercising is fantastic, but not too late in the day. There are a lot of, um, the central nervous system is quite agitated when obviously the sympathetic system is quite working quite hard when we're training uh, to form resilience, to, you know, to, to exercise. But what he's saying is that not too close to bedtime. And a lot of people will say, well, I feel invigorated, but the body needs to actually calm down. The parasympathetic system needs to take over and we need to change. Caffeine and nicotine are hotly debated all the time. And what he's saying here is that the, you know, the effect of caffeine in most people, not all, the effect of caffeine blocks a part of a, of a transmitter or a receptor that allows the body to fully understand that it's time to go to bed. So 12 hours later, even though you don't feel the effects of caffeine anymore, you actually still might be unable to go to sleep because of these receptors being blocked. So he says coffee, cola, certain teas and chocolate contain caffeine and its effects can take as long as eight hours to wear off. Therefore, a cup of coffee in the late afternoon can make it hard to sleep at night. Nicotine is also a stimulant, often causing smokers to sleep only very lightly. In addition, smokers often wake up too early in the morning because they start going through the process of nicotine withdrawal. I'm not saying you should give up coffee uh, uh, and nicotine, but maybe on the weekend, you know, treat yourself. Maybe have a bit less caffeine or try to do one, one caffeine-free day and see how it affects your sleep. It goes without saying that alcohol is detrimental to sleep. I don't even think I need to unpack this, but what it does is it's a sedative, so it makes us pass out, and the problem is none of the effects, none of the effects, the glorious effects of sleep that can help us um, mitigate those mem emo emotional memories, that can help our cognition, that can do all of the paperwork the brain needs to do, none of that stuff can happen because you're getting in the way of that NREM and that REM sleep cycle. And he says here, avoid large meals uh, and beverages at night. A, a light snack is fine, but the need to urinate often comes from, you know, having too many fluids before bedtime. Um, and, you know, too heavily digesting as well can, can be very problematic to keep someone asleep. Don't take naps after 3 p.m. And this is because of the circadian rhythm that we follow. If we take naps after 3 p.m., the brain is already starting to engage the sleep cycle. So when you try to re-engage it later, at around 8 or 9 or 10 o'clock at night, you might find it difficult or hard to fall asleep at night. And he's saying, and this is something you can do this weekend, relax before bed, you know, uh, uh, chill out. Don't schedule things right into the evening. Don't, you know, don't have a frantic meal to make and then prepare and this and that. And keep your schedule light in the evening um, and, and not too many kind of time-based um, stresses before going to bed. And this is really interesting, the body but the body drops by a few degrees when we are ready for bed. It's one of the, the pro physiological processes. So if one takes a hot bath or a hot shower just before bed, the cooling effect as we come out of that shower or bath actually really engages the body and tells us it's time to get to bed. And then the ninth point here is a dark bedroom, cool bedroom, and gadget-free. The less you have to get in the way of your sleep, the more important. He starts his book speaking about how light is so important in controlling our circadian rhythm and our ability to start sleeping and when we need to wake up. And it works in two ways, which I'll get into. But you need to know that if any light is entering from a cell phone or from a lamp or even from little lights on an LED panel uh, by your speaker system, those will have some impact uh, on some of the glands that tell the body it's time to go to bed. This is interesting. If we don't have enough sunlight during the day, some of those chemical processes that balance night and day in our mind and tell us when we can go to sleep don't fully res have a reserve and say, okay, yeah, I got enough sunlight, now it's time for, for, for the dark part of, of sleeping. So if we don't get enough light, um, paradoxically, it makes us quite difficult in the evening to get to bed as well. The book is a stunner. I highly recommend it. And then finally, he says, if you can't sleep, don't lie there and allow your brain to start becoming over-processing and not allowing you to sleep. Rather get up and go do something um, and then slowly make your way back to bed afterwards. Otherwise, we just sit there and the anxiety actually becomes a huge sympathetic system reaction to trying to get to bed. So I hope these have helped. <laughs> I know I sped through them, but it is the weekend, so let's not get too heavy on the psychodynamic dynamic material. Um, I, I wish you all a superb weekend. Please remember that you are always beautiful. You are worthy and you are enough. Um, honor yourself this weekend by putting sleep front and foremost in your plans for the weekend and be gentle with yourself and others. And I will see you all soon.